Okay, let's get started today. We are doing a couple things today. First of all, we are finishing up with XML. There's a few things I want to say, conclusion uh, remarks about it. And then we're going to start into JavaScript. Today, we are going to be looking at an overview of the language, motivating what why it was developed, and some of the things that set it apart from other scripting languages. And then the remaining week and a half that we have with the course will go into more details about how you write the programs to handle uh, client-side scripting. So the two things I want to finish up with XML today is, first of all, I want to compare its file organization to the file organization used with relational databases. And the second thing I want to do is to talk a little bit more about the DOM parser. So I put up here the address book example from last time, where we have essentially two contacts, Mickey Mouse and Brad Vanderzanda. And the way information is stored in XML is fundamentally different than the way it's stored in a relational database. So in a relational database, we actually started with when we did normalization. You may remember that we started often with a so-called universal relation, which had all fields in it. And then we decomposed that universal relation into a set of subrelations, and then each relation was um, realized as a file. In XML, all that information is stored in a single file. It's not decomposed and spread among multiple files. And all of the information associated with an entity is stored with that entity. So for example, in the address book, you have a contact. So you would probably, in a relational database, have a relation that was a contact. And it might have something like, say, a name. Um, it might have a, we'll say, address, let's say city. Now, I know that what is missing here is some additional entities, but let's say that we also had something like children. So we might have child, we want to keep track of the names of children. That would be also stored with the person. Whereas in a relational database, you would probably have a separate relation called child, which would have a name and perhaps the foreign key to the, let's say that there was a social, I don't know, contact ID, a foreign key to the contact ID. So you would have relations that were storing the information, and they would be in different files, and you could use joins to recombine them. In an XML file, everything is simply stored in a nested fashion. Okay, So it's riven with potentially inconsistent data. You may well end up storing the same information multiple times. Uh, the file could be huge because it's not being decomposed. So there are many potential drawbacks to using 
an XML file rather than a relational database, in addition to the drawbacks I cited last time. But at any rate, I just want, uh, let me give you a second example here. Let's go to the notebook. Let's say you had a catalog of your, you're a music, uh, af, how do you say it, aficionado, 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 thank you. So you keep track of all the albums that you have, and you organize them by artist. And perhaps within artist you have a name, and then you may have some CDs, that the artist put out. And within the CD, you might have tracks for each particular song that they did. Okay, so again, all the information with a single artist is being nested and stored with that artist. Whereas if you were doing this as a relational database, you would probably have one relation for artist, one relation for CD, and one relation for tracks. So XML is something that nests everything. Relational databases is something that decomposes and stores things separately and then uses joins to recombine. And the advantage that relational databases get by doing this is that they are less likely to store redundant information. Okay, so that's the first thing I wanted, point I wanted to make. Second thing, I wanted to just say a few things about the PHP DOM parser. So you may remember that the DOM parser, you can use it to create a tree in memory. So you might have something that looks like catalog, artist, artist, say CD, CD, name, track, track, okay, so on and so forth. So you read it in, it parses it, it creates a tree. Now, with the DOM parser, you're able to add new nodes, which each node corresponds to a tag. You're able to delete nodes, which are tags, and you can alter content. And it provides a number of ways that you can navigate this tree. First of all, it's all set up using pointers, so if you want it to, you could simply traverse the tree using pointers. Okay, so ways to navigate the tree or to retrieve elements from the tree. So the first one is to simply use the pointers to traverse the tree. The second thing is that it gives you a number of commands. One of the most useful is get element by ID. I believe that's what it's called. Well, there's two things. Get element by tag name. So there's one command called get 
element by tag name, and you give it a name of a tag, and it returns a list of all children with that tag. So a list of all the nodes. Okay, and there's a second one, get element by ID, which returns a node with the specified ID attribute. And that allows you to get a very specific node within that tree. Now, you'll remember that attributes are a little dicey because not all parsers are guaranteed to return the attribute information. But the DOM parser will return the attribute information for you. Okay. Then there's a third way, which we're not going to talk about, but I just want you to know about. It's a query slash filter mechanism called XPath. So I would call it XML's query language, for lack of a better word. Okay, and it allows you to specify um, patterns. And from those patterns, it will get elements from the tree. Okay, so you kind of give it a pattern. And it matches it, or it returns nodes. Use tags. Or attributes match the pattern. Okay, so bottom line is that it has a rather sophisticated set of methods that allow you to navigate a tree, and then to create new nodes and to delete nodes. So that allow you to manipulate an XML document. I have used both relational databases and an XML, and I much prefer using relational databases. I think that they're a lot cleaner to deal with. And I think a big reason for that is that XML is procedural, whereas relational databases are declarative. So I'll just write that down. Relational databases, you manipulate them declaratively. And XML, you manipulate the documents procedurally. And an example of the difference is that you might like to be able to say something in XML like uh, node equals artist name Brad name say CD name greatest hits Okay, and I would consider this a declarative way of assigning something to that node, but you can't do it that way. It's a series of node equals 
new node and you have to assign then a tag name to it, then you have to create a set of CD or a new CD node and add it to artist. You have to create um, name and well, two name attributes and assign them to the node. So it's just a very intricate uh, set of operations where you're just building up a whole lot of stuff. And even if you could do this kind of assignment here, it's still much more procedural, in my opinion, than relational databases where you're just saying, look, I want all people whose salary is less than 40000 and boom, you got it. Okay, so my preference given one is I try to use relational databases. If I really have a lot of very loosely structured data that doesn't fit well in a relational database, then I fall back to XML. But I only fall back to XML if my data is really loosely structured. And I know that this has been a pretty high-level overview of XML. We just don't have time to go into depth with it, but I did want you to at least be exposed to it so you have some idea about one alternative you can use for um, structuring your data, an alternative to relational databases. So questions about any of that? Okay. In that case, move on to JavaScript. So JavaScript is a language that was developed in the late 1990s as a, um, you might call it an extension language for Netscape or as a way, well it was developed as an extension. language for Netscape. And the idea was that you could modify web pages. Okay, so the idea was um, be able to modify web pages without be able to incrementally modify without rewriting them completely. And it was more than just being able to modify the web pages. You want it to be able to handle form data. You want it to be able to do some simple type checking on that form data to perform some simple calculations on the form data. For example, if you had a quantity field and a number and a price, multiply the price and the quantity to get a total and display that. You might want to be able to modify parts of the HTML document. So it was doing a handful of simple editing tasks. So Basically, want it to be able to do a handful of simple editing tasks. And you should look at the notes because it lists all the different tasks that you should be able to do with it. Actually, we can give you a demo of that. So let's let's see. Create. Where did Emacs go? Emacs disappeared.
Okay, so let's say you want to create a simple form document and we'll name it, um, let's say invoice. And let's say we have two form elements. So we'll have an input type equals text and let's actually label it. So we'll label it quantity. And let's have a second one, price per item. Also make it type equals text. And let's name these things. So name equals QTY for quantity, and name equals price. Okay, so very simple form. Make sure that that works. Okay, so we got two things. We can enter a quantity and a price, okay, but we can't do anything with it right now. Let's say we want it to have a string that would print out and say what the price of the uh, the total price of your um, purchase was. So let's add a line and I want to create something called a span item, which is an inline uh, piece of content. I'll give it the ID total. And initially it will be zero. Okay, so now I put that up. We have total purchase price equals zero. So what we'd like to do is something that as we enter the quantity or the price per item, we can update that, okay? So that's where JavaScript comes in. With JavaScript, we're going to be able to actually compute the price and modify the document in order to reflect the price. So what we want to do is write a simple calculation to take the value of the quantity um, text box and the price in the price per item text box, multiply it together, and then replace this zero with whatever that price is. Okay, so one thing that you get with your form elements is certain events. And when those events occur, you can call a function which is a JavaScript function. So I'm going to call it compute uh, total. And I'm going to do the same thing here when we receive a change event, compute total. Now up in the header part of our document, we're going to create a JavaScript. And if you use the script tag, by convention, it is a JavaScript value. So we're going to create two variables, one to get the quantity, and we can get at it using, so the form is going to be parsed into a tree, because all HTML can be parsed into a tree. That tree is pointed to by a variable called document, so all browsers will create this variable and declare it for you. So all pages have a variable named document. And one way to get at different uh, form elements is by referencing, in this case I need to add an ID field, so ID equals QTY and name, I'm sorry, ID equals price. 
So I can get at them using their ID, and then I can get at the value using the value field. I'll do the same thing for price. Now I can multiply them together. So I'm going to have to convert them both to integers because they come in as strings. And that gives me my total. Now I can check to make sure that my total initially is right. So I'm going to just do an alert box which is a function provided by JavaScript. So I'm just going to initially pop it up to make sure that it's working properly. And I have to add an initial value here because I want it to work in all cases. So I'm going to start with zero. Without that, I could get some funky results from parsint. Parsint on an empty string is going to give me a object or value called not a number and the calculation would fail so I want to make sure that they're both zeros and obviously I'm not doing any type checking but be that as it may so we'll reload that and that did not work why not Oh, right, I never created a function. Duh. Thank you. Needed to call that function compute total. Okay. Load that. Still not working. Okay, why not? Okay, well, the first thing we can do is look at our web console to see if there's any errors. And there do not appear to be any errors. So the second thing we can do. Make sure so compute total make sure that on change is the right event. I'm gonna laugh my head off if my capitalizing it is the problem. Load it. Yep, it was case sensitive. Okay, total equals 500. That doesn't look right. Well, we can go in and see why. So we'll do alert quantity equals plus quantity alert price equals plus price. shouldn't be an issue. It's value equals zero and price equals zero. That should be, in my opinion, let's just see what happens. Quantity is zero. Price is 50. Well, that's pretty odd. Why does it think price is 50? But I didn't set it to 50. Oh, there it is, 50. Yes, oh, I see. It is 50. Sorry, I was 
looking at it and not seeing that. Okay, so let's change the quantity to 10. Quantity is 10, price is 50, total is 500. Okay, so that part is working. Okay, let's now change this span element because that's what we really want to change. So we can also get a hold of content, not just form element stuff. So we can say var um, uh, total, we'll say content equals document dot get element by ID total. Then we'll change its inner HTML. Check that, make sure. Okay, all caps. To be total. So what this is doing is grabbing this particular form element, so there's a node that's identified by total, so it grabs that node, and then various HTML markup elements have a field called inner HTML, which when you change it will change the content. So again, I'll reload, and now we'll enter 75. And you see that the total purchase price changed to 750. So this is a very simple JavaScript program. And you can see what it's doing is it's taking some form data, performing a simple calculation on it, and then it's modifying the content for a specific markup element in the page. So JavaScript was developed to do this kind of simple editing on HTML documents. Now, this was very simple. I'm sure you can come up with a whole host of potential problems. First of all, there's no guarantee that the user entered a valid integer. So presumably, before I do my calculation, I want to ensure that they entered a valid positive, not just integer, but a valid positive number. Um, if I might want to defer doing any calculation until both fields are non-zero, so I might have to put some if and else logic in, but you get the idea about what's going on. It's giving us the capability to do some simple form checking, some simple computations, and some simple modifications to the document. Mm -hmm. So that's what it was developed for. There's a couple neat things about it. It was developed in two weeks by one developer. I once read, he, there was a good book that um, where it's called something like The Great Programmers, and in it, the author had interviewed many of the um, developers of important languages in computer science. So he uh, interviewed people like Ken Thompson, Bjorn Strudstrup. He uh, interviewed the person who developed JavaScript, and essentially he said, my boss said we need something, we need it fast. I had two weeks, I threw something together. And originally they named it Live Script, but the Java was just coming out at that point, and they piggybacked on the coattails of Java by naming, renaming it JavaScript. It's a misnomer because it is not. It does not, it is not like Java, okay? Its design is modeled more after C++, and even there, it differs significantly in the way that objects are handled. 
and we're going to talk about that. It uses what's called a prototype instance model rather than a class instance model. But for whatever reasons it caught on, it is platform independent, so it runs in all browsers, whereas Microsoft developed a competing client-side scripting language called uh, Visual Basic. And I don't know if it now runs on platforms other than Internet Explorer, but initially they only had it running on Internet Explorer. And I believe they naively, well, maybe not naively, but they were trying to essentially corner the market and squeeze the other browsers out. And they figured that since they were Microsoft, Microsoft and Internet Explorer was the biggest browser, people would just develop in Visual Basic, and they were wrong. Um, the fact that JavaScript was platform agnostic made it the choice for most implementations and to my knowledge JavaScript is still the most widely used client-side um, scripting language. Now JavaScript was never designed to be a general purpose programming language and it has a number of significant as originally designed I need to now say as originally designed because as with everything, it grew so popular that they added features. But as originally designed, JavaScript was not meant to be a general purpose programming language. It was designed to interact with a web page and to do simple editing. It was also designed with the idea that it be trusted. If you downloaded a C++ program on your computer and just ran it, would you trust it? Would you take, if, if I just walked up to you Maybe if I did, you might take it. But let's say I look pretty seedy. And I walked up to you, and I said, hey, bud, <laughs> I have this program here that uh, going to let you download some content. Why don't you put it on your uh, machine and give it a whirl? OK? What, why would you be distrustful of it? What about a C++ program would give you the willies? about just running it on your computer? No protections of what kind? File I.O. So one big issue is that a C++ program can go crawling through your files, reading them. So all kinds of sensitive data. They could very well encrypt your files and demand a ransom from you so they can write files. So the big issue with C++ is its ability to get into your file system. So as originally designed, JavaScript did not allow a program to read or write files. Now that's been relaxed and I've seen commands that do read and write files so I'm guessing that there is something where you can give permission now to JavaScript to read or write files. Browsers don't do that. <laughs> Browsers still do not give JavaScript programs the ability to read or write files. You also can't get access to system commands, or a great majority of system commands like fork or exec. 
or other nasties like that that would allow someone to prowl through your computer and do stuff. So it doesn't give you access to system commands. Now, the big one is those two. The, there are subsidiary ones that follow from one. Since you couldn't read or write files, you couldn't really, standard in and standard out are in some sense an extension of the file system. So it did not provide a way to read from standard in. Okay, no big deal because it was meant to take its input from a web page. The whole idea was that JavaScript was taking its input from a web page. So this wasn't, to the developer's point of mind, a big restriction. And for the same reason, you, it did not provide a way to write the standard out. Again, not a big concern because the whole idea was that your output was directed to a web page. But these four things stopped it from being a general purpose programming language. Okay. The only thing I don't know that's been relaxed is its access to system commands. Um, the other ones are all relaxed at this point. And it's become so popular, I hate to say this, but it is now a server-side scripting language as well, which is completely disgusting, but it is what it is. So the idea is that why learn two languages when you could just learn one? And so there are now server-side scripting versions of JavaScript. I guess I shouldn't be so repulsed by it, but I just feel that when a, it's, you design a tool to do something, right? A screwdriver to turn screws, a hammer to hammer in nails, a sledgehammer to do something else. JavaScript was designed to do client-side scripting. PHP was designed to do server-side scripting. I think you're better off using a language for the purpose it was designed for. And I mean, they've taken JavaScript and obviously made it into something that works on a server and people like it, but I don't. So, but it is what it is. So at any rate, this is important. When I ask you on a quiz or I ask you on an exam, what are the limitations of JavaScript? I want you to tell me what the limitations were as it was originally designed. I don't want to hear you quibbling with me about how, yes, you found a command that allows it to read from standard in. Because, yes, I know it's been modified so it can do that. But as originally designed, this is the set of restrictions that were placed on it. And the first two restrictions made it trust it. Because all it could do was interact with your web page and write to cookies, which was a very restricted way to interact with your file system. So you could be sure that a JavaScript program that was downloaded onto your computer wasn't going to run wild and go searching through your file system or modifying your files. Okay, so, okay, so, given that JavaScript has this unusual design, how was it designed to do input and output? Well, you just saw the two different ways that it was designed to do output, alert boxes and modifying the HTML uh, of a the HTML markup, so output 
mechanisms for JavaScript. One, alert boxes. Okay. Two, you have modify the DOM object. The DOM object stands for document object model. Okay, that's surgical. The third way you should not use document.write. What it does takes a string, it replaces the DOM, the complete contents. of the DOM, which means the complete contents of your web page with string. Okay, so it destroys your original content. So I'm just mentioning it because you're going to see it and you should not be using it unless your intent really is to completely destroy the original web page. So the real two output mechanisms are alert boxes, which typically you pop up if there's an error or you're doing debugging. I use alert boxes a lot to do debugging. Or you modify the DOM object, and you saw how I did that by setting things like the inner HTML attribute. Now it turns out you can do other things as well. So I could say, to, uh, let's see, yeah, total content dot style dot Let's just try color. Not sure if it's going to work or not. Yep, if you noticed, it turned blue. So you can modify the, there's a style object associated with each HTML object, and you can modify the various style attributes and change the appearance of things. Similarly, I could actually make the thing disappear. I think it's visibility. Nope, wasn't visibility. Well, I'd have to check what it is, but there is a, let's just try visible. Nope, it's not that either. Okay, I'd have to look it up. But there's a way to control the visibility of elements as well. So you can do, you can disable form elements, you can enable them, you can make things visible, invisible, change their colors, change their fonts, change the width of things. So there's a whole variety of changes that you can make to the content and appearance of an HTML document. Okay, on the input side, because it also takes input, so the input mechanisms one is form data. Now it is true that you can also take technically input from any HTML item, but the idea was that you would take your input from form data. The second is, so I'll just say widgets 
And the second, there is a prompt function which allows you to pop up a dialog box and request input. Now typically the prompt box is simply asking you to confirm an operation such as delete. If you delete you may want to pop up something and confirm that the user really does want to perform the deletion or that they want to continue with some operation. You typically are not going to pop up a dialog box and ask them for the quantity or ask them for the price. That should be accomplished through the form data. So it's typically just used. Okay. In fact, pretty much the only way I use it typically only used to confirm operations. So those are the two primary ways that you get information from a web page. And I just showed you up here. So typically, you either do a query by saying get element by ID and then every form element has a value field that gives you the value or alternatively you can get at it through the name field of the form so Every, let's just try this for a moment. So instead of saying that, we'll say document.invoice.qty.value. Get rid of this style equals invisible. any good. Okay, and it changed it to 19,000. So the other way that you can get at it is every form has an attribute with that particular name in the document. This is actually now the name field. It's no longer the ID field. That's the name field and then the value. So form name This is the um, name attribute of the form element. And value is its value. So two different ways of getting access to a form element. So that's the primary way of getting your input information. So questions about that. Yes, Adam. It's a good question. I don't know because I don't um, duplicate my names. Uh, let's try it. Let's name these things. Let's name both of them price. see what happens. Didn't like it, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> Let's see if there's an error message. Nope, no error message. That's a little more surprising. Okay. So, apparently the answer is not well. 
but that does also point up something else, which is that it doesn't really tell you when you have competing or um, multiply defined names. Not too good. OK. Now, I said that it was modeled after C++. Of all the languages we have talked about, Perl, PHP, a little bit about Python, JavaScript hues most closely to the syntax of C of any of them. So variable names have the exact same naming. And you'll notice that there is no special character in front of the name. The multiplication operators are the same. I'm sorry, the arithmetic operators are the same. The comparison operators are the same. The if-then-else syntax is identical. The switch syntax is identical. The for loops, the while loops, the do while, identical. Okay? So I'm not going to go over it because it's identical to what it is in uh, C++. The functions are started with the function keyword. You can have as many parameters as you want. The one issue is that if you don't declare a variable, it is considered global. Okay, which is like Perl. So if you fail, if you do not declare a variable in a function, it will be placed in the global namespace. Okay, and hence will continue to exist after the function exits. So my recommendation is that you declare your local variables using var. Notice there is no type information associated with it, just the var. So by using the var declaration, it makes it local and it disappears at the end of the function. There is a handy for construct for iterating through arrays. It is for in. What the heck? Wow, I wish I knew how I did that. So somehow I managed to copy the Emacs screenshot into my notebook. That's beautiful. <laughs> if only I knew what I had done to make that happen. I know, I saw it at one point. It, um, actually, I think it's in the ink. I think it's here. Capture, yes. It's the capture button. Okay, great. Okay. Now give me my cursor. Thank you. Okay. The, so there is a for in construct that allows you to iterate through the elements of an array. So... Actually, go okay, so here's an example of the four in loop. So we set up a array, 
And I know I said, don't ever use document.write, but <laughs> here I was just cre um, creating a web page. So for index in pet names, and it, you write it out. Now, how does this for loop, how does this for in statement differ from the other for each or array iterating loops that you've seen in other languages. It's an important difference. Yes? It's in, it's, the value being given to it is the index value, not the value. It's kind of dumb. Yeah, I know. So the for in loop, it is, gives you the, the numeric indices rather than the values. If same thing, if you go through an associative hash table, I guess that makes more sense. If you go through an associative hash table and you can treat an object as though it is an associative um, array, then it gives you back the keys and you can use the uh, key to get access to the uh, property value. So that's just something to be a little bit careful about when you use the for in loop. The big difference between, okay, actually there are a couple things. If you use an array, you'll notice that an array is not a built-in type. It is a object in JavaScript. So you can still use the regular uh, bracket notation to get access to the elements, but it is a object as opposed to a built-in type. Also, JavaScript, whoops, JavaScript does not have a hash table per se. Objects are the way JavaScript implements dictionaries or associative arrays. So if you want a associative array or dictionary, you have to use an object in Java. So you can create an anonymous one. You can say x equals like that, and then you can say x brad equals 10. Okay, so that is acceptable, but you should know that Strictly speaking, JavaScript does not have the conventional idea of a dictionary. It's an object that does double duty as a dictionary in JavaScript. The second big difference is that JavaScript uses what's called a prototype instance model rather than a class instance model. And a prototype instance model differs from the class instance model in a number of important ways. First of all, in the class instance model, the class is not an object. It is a blueprint for how you construct instances of the class but it is not itself an object. By contrast, in the prototype instance model, the prototype replaces a class, and a prototype 
is an actual object that can be modified at runtime. Okay, what that means is that you can add or delete. Okay, so you may add or delete properties at runtime. Now, a property is what we would call an instance variable or a member variable in C++. But in JavaScript, and in fact in most scripting languages, they're not referred to as instance variables. They're typically referred to as key value pairs or property value pairs. In JavaScript, they're property value pairs. So you can add or delete properties at runtime. Okay, same thing with instances. Actually, before I say that, same thing holds for member functions. You may add or delete member functions. Okay. And then with an instance, same thing is true. So I'm just going to say properties A and B hold for instances as well. I'll say prototype properties, which means that you can add and remove properties from instance says at runtime and you can add and delete member functions okay the way that you set up inheritance in javascript so to make a be a sub or to be a prototype You say B dot prototype. Equals A. So the prototype attribute is what sets up the inheritance hierarchy. If you do not find a member function or a member variable in B, it will go and search A. So let's say that you have a dot <coughs> x equals 10. If you now say print b dot x, it will print 10. Now you say b dot x equals 20. And you again say print b dot x, it will print 20. Now you say delete b dot x, print b dot x, and what is the result? 10. Because deleting b dot x simply removes it from the hash table that is b, but now it will follow the prototype link, find the variable or property x in A and print out 10. So you inherit everything from your prototype unless you happen to override it. So why did they do this? Prototypes are much more flexible than classes. With prototypes you can change the look and feel of a graphical interface instantaneously by changing one of its attributes. So let's say 
that you're doing a website and you're trying to improve accessibility. You could try out different colors by simply setting the prototype's color to different color values and instantly all the instances would inherit that value and the interface would change to reflect that color update. So you could sit with a focus group of individuals and just change the color attribute of the prototype, say, what do you think of this color? Clear, less clear, change it again, clear, less clear, and it immediately changes. Whereas what happens if you want to do this with a class instance model? What will you have to do after you change the color? Rebuild and rerun. You'll have to shut down the program, rebuild it, which means recompile it, relink it, reload it, re-execute it, all just to get the change of a single color in the class. So the prototype instance model is much more flexible than the class instance model. Okay? You can also, let's say you have a bug in one of your functions. You simply fix the bug, reload the one file that contains that function, and assign the new modified function to the prototype. So you just say, in that case, a dot uh, print or a dot change value equals, say, change value, where change value is some function that was just modified. And instead of having to shut down the application, so I'm going to say this is a function, so instead of having to shut down the application, re compile, relink, and reload, and re-execute, you simply load in a new version of change value, assign the new function definition to a.change value, and immediately that function definition is propagated to all instances, and the behavior is fixed or modified. So prototype instance models give you the ability, as they imply, to much more quickly prototype and change an interface. So it's along the same idea of make the programmer's life easier. So program, prototype instance model makes the programmer's life easier. because it is both easier and faster to change the look and feel of an interface. So it's prototyping it. It allows you to quickly prototype it for your customers. Okay, what do you give up? This seems pretty, pretty spiffy. Okay, in fact, a class instance model could well take up more storage because you have to, in a class instance model, every instance gets a copy of all the instance variables from a parent. But in the prototype instance model, the parent just stores them. You just have to follow the prototype chain, and you get them. So the storage may be less. So what's the drawback? Why, why don't Java and C++ adopt the prototype instance model? Hard to optimize. It's slow. So it, the whole idea with compiled languages like Java and C++ is machine efficiency. Prototype instance models aren't easily 
optimized. So if I can add or delete properties dynamically, how do you think it's storing the properties? What kind of data structure underneath? Hash table. Okay. Whereas in a class instance model, it lays it out essentially as a struct with fixed offsets. So in the class instance model, it's a very fast access to any particular instance variable, whereas in the prototype instance model, you're doing hash table accesses. It's a lot slower. Same thing on function calls. The function calls are being looked up in a hash table rather than through a jump table. So the class instance model makes the program faster. Because instance variables are stored in structs rather than hash tables. And member functions are accessed via via jump tables. Yeah, I'll put in parentheses V tables rather than hash tables. So you play a price. It's the old conundrum. Prototype, I'm sorry, scripting languages make the programmer's life easier at the expense of machine efficiency. Compiled languages like C++ and C and Java make the program faster at the expense of programmer flexibility. So this is just one more example of scripting languages adopting an object model, well, making the programmer's life easier by adopting a different object model that is more flexible for the programmer but less efficient for execution. Okay, so Thursday we're going to, well, I pretty much covered the fundamental differences between JavaScript and other languages. On Thursday we are going to pick up with what? Take a quick look. We're going to pick up with uh, the HTML DOM, so how that operates, how you're able to change it, what the API is, et cetera, et cetera. So I will see you all Tuesday.